In chapter 13, we're talking about experiments and observational studies. Experiments and observational studies. So the first thing we're going to talk about is observational studies. Okay. In an observational study, you have some researcher that is simply observing behaviors, observing characteristics. They're not actually like, doing anything to anybody. So they're pretty much just sitting around taking notes. Okay? There's two types of observational studies. Retrospective and prospective. Retrospective, just like what retro implies, retro makes you think like old, right? Retrospective means you're taking historical records, okay? So maybe I wanted to see if your all's grades improved from fifth to sixth grade. Then I would go back and pull your fifth and sixth grade grades. I'm not doing anything to you all. I'm just going back and pulling records. So I'm using old information to make some judgments, okay? The other one is called a prospective study. And in a prospective study, I would be observing behaviors over time. So I would select all of you, okay? And I would say, I'm going to observe your study habits. And maybe I do this for a week, or maybe I do this for a month, or maybe I do this for a year. But I identify you guys first, and then I follow you and take notes on whatever characteristic I'm thinking about over a certain period of time. Does that make sense? So you have retrospective and prospective. Okay. This is the only information about observational studies in the entire chapter. So even though the chapter is entitled Observational Studies and Experiments, the focus of the chapter is experiments, okay? So again, in summary, observational study, something you're actually just observing characteristics, observing behaviors. Retrospective is from the past, you're pulling records from the past. Prospective, you're identifying people and then following them and recording information over a period of time. But at no point am I going to change your routine or anything. Questions about observational studies? All right. Then the rest of what we're going to talk about today is experiments. I'm going to hit you with a lot of vocabulary. And then over the next few days, we'll try to make it make more sense. So in an experiment, I am changing something and your daily routine, or I'm telling you to do a specific thing because I'm going to compare the results of everyone at the end. But I am actually actively changing something. All right? So in an observational study, I'm just sitting around taking notes. In an experiment, I'm actually t keeping track of people doing specific activities. All right? You guys have all learned about experiments before in biology. Just like in chapter 11 and 12, we still have random assignment. Okay, so again, let's say we're doing an experiment now, and all of you guys are my experiment. I'm going to do an experiment on study habits. So I'm going to have some of you guys study for two hours a night, and some of you study for an hour a night, and some of you study not at all. Okay, but we're going to look at your test grades. Doesn't sound very fair, does it? But in order to kind of equalize all my groups, I'm going to randomly assign you to one. I'm going to let you pick which one you're in. I'm going to randomly assign. So random assignment reduces variability, and it equalizes the groups. We want to make the group as much as the same as possible, and we can't do that by just selecting people, human error. So we're going to randomly assign them. Some more vocabulary. Whatever I'm changing is called a factor. So you can call it an explanatory variable, but it's just whatever I'm changing. So for the rest of this slide, I'm going to use a specific experiment, okay? 
I think I've got the key to weight loss, all right, with these diet and exercise ideas. All right, I have these different diet plans, different exercise plans. And you guys are all going to be my experiment. The diet plan, the exercise plans, I'm changing two different things of your daily routine, right? I'm changing your diet and exercise. So I have two different factors because I'm changing two different things. So for my example, factors are diet and exercise. So you can have more than one thing that you're changing, okay? At the end of my experiment, I'm going to compare weight loss. I'm going to weigh you at the beginning and weigh you at the end. So my response variable is something that I'm going to measure. So at the end, whatever you're comparing, whatever you're measuring, that's going to be your response variable. So your explanatory variable is called a factor, and it's what you're changing. And the response variable is what you're measuring and what you're going to compare. All right. So people that we experiment on are called subjects or participants. So you all would be my subjects or participants in this study. I don't know if you're using plants or animals, we call them experimental units, right? Because they aren't actually going to have human characteristics. I have two more vocabulary words for you, so we're going to be using that diet and exercise example. The specific changes you're going to make in each of the factors is called a level. So. Remember, I had two factors. I had diet and I had exercise. Those are my two factors. Well, let's say I have two plans for both of those. I have plan A and B for diet and plan A and plan B for exercise. Well, that means that I have two levels for each factor because I have two plans for each one. If I threw in a plan C for diet, then I would have three levels for diet and two levels for exercise. It's just however many types you have for each factor. Questions about that? And then lastly, the combination of all of those levels is called a treatment. So in this case, I have four separate treatments in my exercise and diet example. So one treatment is going to be diet plan A and exercise plan A. So some people are going to be in that group. My second treatment is diet plan A and exercise plan B. Then I'm going to have diet plan B exercise plan A, and then lastly, diet plan B, and exercise plan B. So I have two factors with two levels each, and that gives me four treatments in this example. Do we get the difference between a factor, a level, and a treatment? Factors is what you're changing. Level is the different groups in each of those factors, and the treatments is the combination of all of them. All right. A little bit more, and then we're going to do some examples, and I'll be done. There are four principles of experimental design. The first three are mandatory if possible. You want to use the first story principles if you can. It makes your experiment the best it can be. So the first principle is that you need to have a control. And the control is just going to be a baseline. So maybe if you're doing the diet and exercise example, maybe you have a separate treatment where people have no specific diet and no specific exercise regimen and they are just doing their normal thing. Um, in like medical examples, you guys have heard of placebos or you like a fake pill, 
Well, so that would be a control because you're giving someone a pill, but it's really not doing anything. So you can compare what really is happening with real medicine to what's happening with the fake medicine. All right. So you're always going to compare back to your control. That's going to have the least amount of change possible. We talked about this a little bit earlier. You want to randomize. Again, it allows you to equalize the effects of unknown sources of variation. So we just want to put people in random groups. We don't want to just put this person in this group and this person in this group because we feel like it. Okay? So you want to randomize. And that way there's no human error in picking what the treatment is. The next one is replicate, and that just means, I guess, repeat. So let me give you a new example. Let's say you're doing that plant type experiment you did in middle school, where you have different plants, and you're going to give some plants full sunlight, and some plants half sunlight, and some plants no sunlight. Okay? Well, if you only put one plant in each of those groups, what happens if that plant dies? then you can't use anything about that specific treatment because your plant's dead. You can't do anything with it. So you want to make sure you have multiple subjects or multiple experimental units in each treatment. You just don't want to have one person or one plant in case, again, something happens. Experiments can go on for a long time. So if you're trying different medicines or something, you know, things can happen. So you want to make sure that you have multiple people in each group. You also, a second kind of application, you want to repeat your experiment again if you think the results are significant. Just doing your experiment one time, maybe you just got lucky with your results. So you want to do it again in a different climate, in a different state. Just repeat it just to see if the same thing happens. So not only do you want to have multiple subjects, you want to repeat your experiment if at all possible. The last principle is not necessary. You don't have to have it. But the last one is called blocking. So if you think back to chapter 12, we had stratified samples. What did a stratified sample mean? You put people in the groups and surveyed a few from each. Blocking is essentially the same thing, but for experiments. So in a block design, you group people and do the entire experiment in each group. So let's say we go back to my diet and exercise example. And I think that my diet and exercise plans are going to be different for males and females. If I'm randomly assigning males and females to groups, I might end up with no males in a specific group. So what we're going to do is we're going to have males and have four treatments that are all males. And then we're going to have four treatments that are all females. That way I can go back and compare at the end, males to males, females to females, treatment to treatment. So again, blocking is just grouping similar individuals together. I'm going to do two examples, and I'll give you the time. For his statistics class experiment, researcher Jay Gilbert decided to study how parents' income affects children's performance on standardized tests like the SAT. He proposed to collect information 
from a random sample of test takers and examine the relationship between parental income and SAT score. Is this an experiment? Is he actually doing anything to anybody? No. This is not an experiment. He's not actually putting people into groups and giving them different treatments or anything. He's just interested in the relationship between SAT score and parental income. So what kind of study is this? If it's not an experiment, what are we going to say it is? An observational study. But then more specifically, is this retrospective because the records already exist? Or is this prospective because it's going to follow these people over time? Retrospective. Excellent. People have already taken the SAT. The parent's income is already on record. He's just going back and pulling that information. So it's retrospective. On B, if there's a relationship between parental income and SAT score, why can't we conclude that differences in score are caused by differences in parental income? Have we had a chance yet to have a cause and effect relationship in this class? Does something ever cause something else? Not so far, right? With an experiment, you might actually get to say that. But with an observational study, there is still no cause and effect relationships. Only associations. So with an observational study, I can't say that a high SAT score was caused by high parental income. But I can say that they're associated or linked. Does that make sense? Because you're not doing anything. You're just looking at records. One more question. Researchers studied the herb black cohosh as a treatment for hot flashes caused by menopause. The randomly assigned 351 women aged 45 to 55 who reported at least two hot flashes a day to one of five groups. And they give you five different treatment groups. After a year, only the women give, given estrogen replacement therapy had symptoms different from those of the placebo group. So what kind of study is this? Is this an observational study or an experiment? Yeah. Experiment. You're putting them into specific groups with a specific treatment, right? On B, is this an appropriate choice for this problem? Would there be a way to do an observational study of this? Not really, it'd be really hard to find records of people taking these specific supplements with specific measurements that you'd want, right? So this is a perfectly good choice, right? It's ethical, there's no like weird things going on with people getting something that's gonna cause them harm or anything, right? You're just giving them different treatments and you're gonna analyze the results later. So that's fine. Who are the subjects? So who are the subjects of the experiment? All right, the 351 women, you want to be as specific as possible. So 45 to 55, right, with at least two hot flashes a day. All right. And then the last part is identify the treatment and response variables. I'm not going to take the time to write them down right now. But these are all the treatments, all the ones that were numbered. So there were five treatments, and you wouldn't be able to list those. What is the response variable, though? Like, what are they looking at? What are they trying to determine? What was the whole point of doing this experiment? All right. All right. We're, signed, we're trying to see which treatment improves hot flash symptoms, right? If we could find that and we could prescribe that to everyone, that would be nice. And if they do tell you in the end of the problem, they do find that one group 
actually does have significant symptoms that are different than placebo group, which is your control. Questions about those?